Leo Murphy. Thank, thank you, you Senator. Professor. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, Professor. Just <coughs> coming back to this, the area of social partnership, is it your view that social partnership um, played a, a role in our financial crisis or contributed to it? Um, yes, it is. I, I think that uh, the deals which were struck uh, specifically around the question of wage moderation on the one hand, again, I'd emphasize that, that Irish wages did not stagnate like uh, they did in the United States and to a certain extent in, in Britain. Uh, the wage moderation in exchange for uh, eroding the tax base was, was uh, a, a poor decision, and it was a poor decision, I think, which was reached collectively. <laughs> that is, we had tripart nego tripartite negotiations with uh, the representatives of the employers' associations, the, the main union federations, uh, and the government, and I think the government, the employers, and the unions all participated in that decision, and I, I think we've come to regret it. I got the implication from your, your opening statement that maybe you felt that the unions had, had or had not a choice in engaging in social partnership. That, that's, uh, that's something which I think um, the historians of uh, Irish labor will, will debate. Uh, I think they did take a choice. Uh, and that choice was taken in light of what was going on across the water and in light of a fear of Thatcherism. And you're basing that, I mean, that, that opinion that you expressed is based on uh, some historical work that you've already done, or is it just...? It's based on some of the historical literature and also some of the personal contact I've had with the labor movement. Okay. Over the years. Okay. Uh, Thank you. And um, to come back to another point as well that you mentioned in relation to the European Central Bank, I think central banks uh, generally, you talked about a lack of democracy in that institution. Could you expand on that point? Certainly. Uh, and, and I think that this is uh, very much uh, a trend uh, internationally. I think we've been moving farther and farther away from democratic influence on economic decisions. Um, the uh, model, in a certain sense, is the independence of the American Federal Reserve. Um, but the American Federal Reserve has a double mandate. Um, their mandate is, on the one hand, to control inflation. Uh, but their mandate is also uh, to address the problems of unemployment when they arise. Uh, and our central bank, which is the European Central Bank, is not mandated uh, to address the problem of low levels of economic activity throwing people out of work. It's explicitly left out of their charter. Uh, they are solely responsible for maintaining stable prices. Uh, and in that sense, uh, I think we kind of have a, an ultra-monetarist uh, central bank, much more monetarist than, than you'd find in the United States. You see that as a design flaw? It's very definitely a design flaw. When you talk about, you know, increasing how an institution is run and bringing democracy into it, I mean, c can you do that with the central bank without bringing in political interference? Um, well, it, it, it's, uh, I wouldn't want to define democracy as political interference. Uh, I think that uh, if we were to democratize economic decision-making at that level, that is, at the high level of central banking, I think we would need to uh, reform uh, our democratic institutions all the way down uh, to make sure that uh, what we were seeing was the expression of popular will rather than the interference by politicians or vested interests. Um, the, that said, I think that uh, the performance of the central bank in the absence of political supervision has been extraordinarily poor. I mean, it's, we've just seen quantitative easing seven years after, uh, seven years after it was uh, first engaged in and rather successfully. Uh, by the Federal Reserve Bank in the States. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.